Think about all the times that you've looked at homeschool curricula and it's about schedule and program. Follow these steps, you will result in this kind of educated person. One of the problems with programmatic learning is it quickly moves into measurement and institutionalization. That's what school is. If you think back to the one room schoolhouse or the tutorial model of yesteryear, whether it was the little house on the prairie type of schoolhouse or the tutors hired for the very you know elite in Russia or France or England for the royalty, all of those educations, they had some regimentation to them. Certainly they were using books and they were uh, following plans, but there was a sense of tailor-made education for the child and a dialogue and a communication around what was being learned that fostered a deeper engagement. So when I was looking at how can people implement a lifestyle of learning, for my own kids, this isn't just for you guys, this is like what I had to think about with my own children, I knew I didn't want a program. I found myself repeatedly feeling guilty about not doing a program or not having you know, a schedule that I followed perfectly with check boxes. But what I noticed is that the most engagement from my children and between us happened when we had this rich deep dive, what I call the deep dive, into a specific area for study. So one of the earliest times of that experience in our family came around birds. I remember I had decided to learn about birds with my kids. I think I had a Family Fun Magazine article. I've often told you that was my secret curriculum tool for years. Um, I used Family Fun Magazine and they had a backyard bird party and all these different ways to learn about birds. One of the ways was to take a raw chicken and investigate the way the legs moved and how the wings worked and to look at the muscles and to peek under the skin. They even said it would be better if you got a whole chicken where it was obvious that there had been feathers in those feather shoots. Like, how obvious? I mean, we buy chickens all the time, but I never thought about investigating a chicken. You know, taking out the liver, the heart, the lungs, and actually looking at it as a science experiment, not just eating it for dinner. So we did that. Another thing we did is we coated our hands in Crisco, and then I made a great big bucket of ice. It was filled with ice, we added a little water, and we took one hand without Crisco and plunged it into the bucket and our hands froze. Then we took our other hand and we plunged it into the bucket, you couldn't feel the cold because of the fat coating our hands. That's like a duck. That's what they have when they're out on cold water. They can't feel it because they're coated in fat. My kids loved that. I mean, who doesn't want to put Crisco all over a five-year-old's hand and plunge it into ice water? Um, we did some things with flight. We made these little tiny parachutes and we threw them off of our balcony so they could see the properties of flight. We collected a whole bunch of different kinds of feathers and then learned about the different shapes of a tail feather versus a wing feather versus the down that's inside of a pillow. Then we played a game, you could totally do this. We took um, a hula hoop and we laid it on grass and then in that grass I put all different kinds of foods that birds eat, peanuts, we used gummy worms, sunflower seeds, um, chopped up chunks of suet. You know, we just gathered a whole bunch of these things, threw them into the middle of this hoop, and then we had a collection of tools that mimicked different beak styles. So we had chopsticks, we had tongs, we had a suction cup, we had toothpicks. Um, no, I didn't think of all this on my own. Half of it came from Family Fun Magazine. I'm always looking for ideas. My brain is not creative enough to think of all of these, right? So, oh, we'll see you a little later, little schoolhouse. Um, no, I'm not creative to think of all of these on my own. I was constantly scouring other materials. And you have to remember, I started homeschooling before the internet. There was no Pinterest, there were no blogs, there was no Wikipedia, there were no curriculum companies. It was me in a library and a bunch of friends. So we subscribed to Family Fun Magazine, which was really helpful. And then we would, we would go to the library all the time, my friend and I, and we would look for ideas. 
And of course, yeah, I think Family Fun is still out. I don't know that it's as good as it was when we first started. But on the other hand, you have Pinterest. <laughs> so you know what I'm saying? Like you have the whole internet at your fingertips. We have scopers in our Brave Scopes group who are beyond creative. Just this morning, not before seven, did a whole scope on party school around the book Love That Dog, which is our January Arrow language arts selection for Brave Writer. Totally creative. Follow her. That's the way to learn how to do this stuff. So yes, you're asking, did I do unit studies? Well, these were basically unit studies, weren't they? So I was doing birds. We did uh, the gold rush. We did Native Americans. We did medieval feast. We had a colonial party. I mean, I did anything we studied. I tried to find practical, tangible ways to express it because that's how children learn. And so when I'm talking about um, a lifestyle, what I'm saying is you are on the lookout for learning opportunities. A lifestyle is being on the lookout for learning opportunities. A program is doing what you're told. Okay, so that's really the difference. Can you use a program? Yes, but don't let the program use you. I mean, I had plenty of curriculum in my house and all the unschoolers who say things like, oh, you know, if it's a curriculum, don't use it. I found that not helpful because I needed a huge variety of materials to trigger my imagination. I mean, I'm already raising children, cooking, cleaning, managing a household, going to ballet practice, watching my kids at soccer. How can I also be thinking of all the creative ways to teach about Japan? I just can't. I need someone to make a list for me to at least flip through and allow my imagination to get going, right? So the lifestyle is being on the lookout for learning opportunities and putting learning opportunities in your path, like that you can't miss it. You're going to run smack dab into them. So Family Fun was kind of that magazine for me. My little community of homeschool friends, they were that for me. We would brainstorm together. I used to get together with a group of friends um, every Saturday morning, and we would go to Mimi's Cafe and talk about Charlotte Mason and brainstorm ways to make our homeschools more interesting. Literally, that's all we did. Now, you guys can do that online. You don't have to meet at Mimi's Cafe, though I totally recommend it. <laughs> it's a great idea. Get out of the house, have some French toast, talk with your girlfriends, and make it be your little teacher's lounge moment in person with good people. Okay, so very good. So let's actually look at the list. I have one behind me. And then we're going to check things off as I talk about them. So hold on a minute while I pull it closer. Hold on. Woo! This is what I mean. I'm not as organized today. All right, here I come. And I'm sorry if you're looking at my backside. All right. Can everyone see my list? All right, I will get my markers. I'm still here. Don't think I've left. I am still here. <laughs> I'm glad I'm scoping on this too. All right, so clearly we all know the first big Brave Writer lifestyle item is poetry tea time. So I thought we would start there. A poetry tea time, if you are uninitiated to Brave Writer, is basically setting a beautiful table, drinking tea, and reading poetry books. It really is that simple. You don't have to analyze poetry, write poetry, or create fanciful cucumber sandwiches and scones and Devonshire cream. All you need are Oreo cookies and tea, or orange juice and cinnamon sticks. I mean, you can pick anything. It can be orange slices. It doesn't matter. The idea is taking some time out of your day to read poetry, but they like poetry better, apparently, if you set the table and provide them with snacks. Very easy. Now, I recommend once in a while just going all out. Why wouldn't you? That's fun. Oh, I'm going to plug my mic back in. That's fun, right? Setting the table, lighting the candle, um, making a snack together, right? Like, that's fun. Do that once in a while. But on the regular basis, my goodness, we have people who do poetry tea time at breakfast. They pull out the poetry books while they're having breakfast. There is something about that pairing of that dynamic that is just so effective. I was asked how often our family did it. There was a season where we did it every day because we were into it. There was a season where we did it once a week 
because I liked that. And then there was a time when it was less than once a week and then everybody missed it. <laughs> Our kids who are all adults. Oh yeah, I want to show you my kids. Hold on. My five kids are now adults. This is what they look like when I was homeschooling. Are they cute? These are my children. I have two redheads. And I have all these other kids. I know, right? I just, I have to show you them because unfortunately they're grown now and you might not really believe I ever had small children. Yeah, they're so cute. So anyway, my lovely kids love poetry tea time. So much so that the middle child went off to college as a resident assistant in a boy's floor on the, uh, on a boy's floor in the dorm and he brought teapots and poetry books with him and he would conduct these little poetry teas in his room. Uh, of course, it was a total babe magnet. Women love him. Okay, <laughs> so that's a tip you can give to your boys. All right, um, so poetry tea time, we've got it. All right, second one. Oh, and you should know, my fourth child, who's also a boy, he's running a poetry slam every week at his college, and right now, 10% of the school shows up every week for this poetry slam. They have people booked to share their poetry all the way through April. So yeah, if you get this uh, you know, thing going in your family, who knows where it will lead? All right, so that's poetry tea time. Okay, second one, read alouds. I have covered this so amply, I hate to overdo it, but let's just talk about it quickly. A read aloud is a book that you read aloud to your children. Can they read aloud to each other or to you? Sure, that's not really what I mean when I'm talking about a read aloud. When I'm talking about it, I mean, I'm reading, kids are listening. And I did it every morning. I did a whole scope on morning routine, which you can look up. And I tell you the number of books that I read each day. And I tell you what the variety was. And it usually took me about an hour. And it is the core of our homeschool. It is all of our best memories. It is the foundation of their education. And I'll tell you this right now. You cannot, you cannot overestimate the value of reading to your children, okay? So do it, just do it. Um, let's see, yeah, someone says Trumpet of the Swan. Oh, you're reading it for the first time? Oh my gosh, do you not love the dad? Don't you wanna go around quoting him all the time? And don't you love Lewis? He is so charming. And then what about the little boy and his nature journal and the question he asks himself before he falls asleep every night? I mean, what a book, so good. Yeah, if you get through your morning routine and then the, the whole day devolves, you know that you've had a good day. That's what I love about read alouds. Okay, so we've done read alouds. Let's check that one off. All right, next one. Copy work and dictation. Okay, can you see it? It's down here. Oh, there it is. Okay, copy work and dictation. All right, so here's the thing. I was reading, I don't do this very often because you have to have a really strong, fortified <laughs> ego to do this, but occasionally I like to go and click around some of the homeschool discussion boards and just get a sense of what people think about Grave Rider so I can improve products, so we can make sure our service is working well. You know, and somebody somewhere made the comment that um, in my 55 things scope, where I share all the things I didn't do, she said, oh, I lost interest because she didn't do any of the things that she teaches in Brave Writer or Cells. And I just feel I have to say that's not true. I did everything that we sell and teach, everything. That is just what you need to know right now. Did I have a product? No, I was creating things as I went. So obviously Brave Writer is the result of so much of what I did in homeschool. And so I'm gonna show you an example right now because I feel defensive. We totally did copy work and dictation. Let's see, do I have that notebook? Yes, stay tuned. I'll be right back, it's over here. I'm still here, I'm just getting one of my student notebooks. Okay, this is Noah's work, I believe. It might be Jake's. Oh no, it's Jacob's, okay. I want you to see that we did actually do copy work. <laughs> I want you to know that we really did. We did a ton of it, okay? A ton. I have notebooks like this. Here's what's hilarious. My kids don't remember that we did stuff. 
I had to pull out all these notebooks and show them that we had done copy work and dictation and free rights and all kinds of worksheets and everything. And they're like, oh, we did a lot of school. Now, this is hilarious to me. I was reading someone's post, I think on Brave Scopes, and somebody said that she was mortified. It might have been the Brave Writer Lifestyle page, actually. She was mortified because she was with some friends and her kids said they don't do much or they're not really learning or homeschool isn't really happening. And I laughed with recognition. My kids have said all that stuff. They've told people that homeschool wasn't hard. They've said we didn't do homeschool. One of them said we never did anything. Katrin says she was never educated, that she, <laughs> that she did it all herself, that there was no actual homeschooling. <gasps> do you know why? Because our lives were so wonderful. <laughs> they didn't recognize it as school. Now, I use the word wonderful with just a little hint of irony because, of course, there were days that were boring and fights ensued and all kinds of problems. But the truth of the matter is, homeschool did not feel like school. And so many things, yes, copy work can be about anything. It's copying an address, your name, a, a quote out of a book, um, a quote off of a refrigerator magnet. You know, it doesn't matter. But what was happening in our family is that once we got some of these routines in place, it was just the life we were leading. And it didn't take that much time. I mean, our days were not from eight in the morning till three in the afternoon. They just weren't. We had two or three really good hours before lunch. And then usually after lunch, we might have a little bit more, right? That was kind of the routine for most of the years. And so I just want you to know, oh, Kira, I love you. Welcome. Age 11. Like having you on here. Um, so that's the kind of thing that we did. We had this lifestyle. And sometimes it's invisible to your kids. Okay, high school will do another time. But yes, it continued that way. My oldest son, Noah, homeschooled all the way through. And he did a lot of stuff completely independently. He quit traditional high school education at age 16, um, which freaked me out. He was my oldest child. And, you know, he's a completely successful human being today at 28. <laughs> so I worried for nothing. But yes, we'll, we'll look at high school again. I've done scopes on high school already. You can look those up in the archive called Catch um, with a K. But what I want to talk about today is the lifestyle. So copy work and dictation, we usually did those once to twice a week. Sometimes we went through periods where we did copy work every single day. Do you know why? Copy work's easy. You can all sit at the table. I encourage you to be able to do copy work with your kids. I had my own notebook that I filled up with quotes from the books I was reading or any information that helped me with home education, any inspiration. Um, and I would sit at the table, we'd light a candle. Sometimes we'd put on a soundtrack to a movie that was, you know, like classical music and we would copy. It was lovely. And when Katrin was sort of my last child being homeschooled, she continued to do copy work all the way up to high school. My adult children still collect quotes and keep them in notebooks and in little places on their phones and trade them with each other. So it, this is another lifelong habit that you can build. And it's not just about spelling and punctuation. It's about an appreciation for language and words of inspiration that help to calm you or stimulate you or move you to action. So that's something to really consider. Yes, Commonplace Book. E.M. Forster's Commonplace Book is over on my bookshelf. I look through his occasionally. He's my favorite. Okay, so we did copy work and dictation. We have products in Brave Writer that help you with copy work and dictation. So if you go to our store, store.bravewriter.com and look at language arts tools, you can get some help there. All right, next one, art appreciation. I'm gonna go grab my basket, hold on. Doo -doo -doo. The basket's too heavy, I'm just gonna bring the books. Oh my God, they're so heavy, you just can't even believe. But we have so many, oh my goodness, okay. <laughs> Today's scope is hilarious, all right. So I loved art and I loved learning it with my kids. And it became a complete passion for me. So what I did is, first, I had no money. So I checked out tons of art books from the library. You realize, right, 
that you can homeschool completely with just the library. You totally can. And I had to do that for years because we were literally without money. We lived on um, bread and water. <laughs> or as I've told people, tortillas and beans with cheese. We had that every day for, I mean, a decade, seriously. So I would go to the library. Then what I did, oh, see you, Jeanette. Then what I would do is when I would see like these really cheap books at half price books that were the big gorgeous art books, I would buy them. So here's an example, The World of Art. And this would just go up on our coffee table. And while we would be watching, you know, uh, the Narnia Chronicles or uh, Arthur or whatever, I might just pull it out and page through it. And then I would just look and I'd be like, oh, here's a painting that I really love. And I would just start talking about the painting. And then I'd ask a kid to come over and sit with me and tell me what they liked about the painting. Did you know that the start of analysis is just careful looking? That's all analysis is. It's not fancy. We've evolved all this language to apply to literature and the arts. Of course we have. But what we're really doing is we are learning how to express what we see and how we make connections and the correlations between works of art. So you can do that. You can just page through. Here's a great example of an amazing picture. There's Marilyn Monroe. I know who that is. Why do I know who this is? But I don't know who this is. What a great conversation that would be to have with your child about art. It's just careful looking, right? having conversations. So you start art appreciation by appreciating art. You start by appreciating it, noticing it, looking at it, talking about it. You don't start art appreciation with a program. That's what I mean by lifestyle. And if you were on my scope where I read the Robert Frost poem, um, The Road Not Taken, where it says, way leads on to way, that's the lifestyle, right? You start by appreciating art, you notice something you like, you follow the rabbit trail of that artist, you go into a museum and find something that matches, and you talk about it. That's education. It's not a lot more complicated than that. Oh, it shouldn't be intimidating at all. Norman Rockwell is a fabulous way to start if you're intimidated. There is a debate about whether or not he's actually an artist or if he was an illustrator. To me, how can you be an illustrator and not be an artist? Hello, look how intricate these drawings are. But because he was being commissioned by the Saturday Evening Post, a lot of people say that's not the same as being an artist. I totally disagree. And I feel I have the right to disagree and have my opinion. But what's fun about Norman Rockwell is he catalogs American history in the 20th century. And I think it's really fun to use a book like this to talk about American history. Who's included in these paintings? Who's excluded? Look at this work that he did at the end of his life where he is showing all of humanity together. And yet, if you look at most of his, and the name of that painting, by the way, is The Golden Rule. And yet, if you look at most of his paintings, it's white people in America. Why? because that's what we were about back then. So you can have conversations about political values, social values, the history of America, um, our culture, debates about artists versus illustrators, all from just the enjoyment of a book like Norman Rockwell. Do you see what I mean by lifestyle? Is this history or art or social studies or politics? What is it? I don't know. It's all of it. It's all of it. And then you can even just Notice his sense of humor. He's hilarious. Um, I have a book focused on the Renaissance. And you just go through and you can see the whole story of the Renaissance. Like, why wouldn't you? So here's just like a historical painting showing the Vatican. And then, I mean a picture, excuse me, of the Vatican. And then all the works of art in the Vatican. Why wouldn't we look at this when we're studying Renaissance history, right? Have fun at ballet. I miss those days. <laughs> And then, of course, Impressionism. I'll tell you a cute story about this book. I loved art even before I had children. I had lived in France and had been to all the great museums. And we moved to Morocco, my husband and I, no children yet. We were brand newlyweds. And I turned 
24 when I first moved there. And um, he had this book shipped from America for my birthday, which was incredible because it was very expensive and there was no Amazon.com back then. He had to get somebody to go buy it, box it up, mail it, and make sure it got there by my birthday. So I have great fond memories of that. And here is amazing paintings that I can see close up with some detail. This is just called Impressionism. There's millions of these. You won't find this specific book anymore. I'm sure it's out of print, but just go find some, okay? And here's the thing, if it's your passion, your spouse will buy you gifts. Your kids see you getting a book about art for your birthday, does that make it a school subject? Nope, nope, it's suddenly changed. Not from a school subject, but to passion, but to a person's personal possession. Does that make sense? So that's what the lifestyle is too, it's catering to your passions. All right, we did our appreciation. We're going, we're going. Um, what time do we have here? Oh my goodness, it's taking so long. We might not get through it all today because I wanna get off in time for other people to scope. Shakespeare is our next one. I, I knew about art growing up, but I didn't really study it until college. I was a, a history major at UCLA and my Western civilization instructor for three quarters had the most incredible slideshow of art in Europe. So uh, that's when I first really discovered art. Then I went to France as an exchange student my junior year and got to visit all these incredible museums in France, in Italy, in Spain, in Switzerland, and I fell head over heels in love for art then. So when I had children, art appreciation was something I was still very interested in. But what happened once I had kids is I heard about Sister Wendy, who's this incredible nun with buck teeth who talks about art, and she just made it very accessible for our family. And we started, you know, really looking through books together. So that's my story with art. So then the next thing is Shakespeare. Shakespeare. In our family, we watched movies, we read Shakespeare stories, we read poems, and we went to plays. It's very, very important to see Shakespeare performed. Do not think that it's better to read the play first. You would be wrong. <laughs> Plays are meant to be acted. They are dead on the page. It's cold, lifeless, a cold, lifeless script. So don't do it. You will hate Shakespeare. Go see it performed by a quality company. Sometimes summer stock Shakespeare out in the park is terrible. So if you go to a play and you didn't like it, it means it's a bad cast. It doesn't mean you didn't like Shakespeare. So make sure that you find a quality company. Ask around. Cincinnati has a phenomenal Shakespeare company. Oregon has some good ones. California has a ton. I'm certain New York does. Um, how, to, how to teach your child Shakespeare, I haven't used. It looks wonderful though. Yeah, so Shakespeare is worth it. And in my family, two of my kids went on to be a part of Shakespeare acting companies for high school and did it for years, I, like six years, four and six years each. So there is a rich opportunity with Shakespeare. But start with movies. We watched, you know, the Zeffirelli, Romeo and Juliet and Much Ado About Nothing. Just know that sometimes there's a little nudity and Shakespeare deals with sex. So occasionally it shows up in some way. Most of that will go over your kids' heads, but I don't want you to be alarmed if you see it and think, why didn't Julie warn me? I'm warning you. Okay, Shakespeare's awesome. We liked the Mel Gibson Hamlet even. You know, Glenn Close is in there. There's some great actors in these movies. Helena Bonham Carter. Yeah, there you go. Oh, I'll hold up the chart. Sure, this is just page one. Ah, can you see it? Page one. Go ahead and take a quick click if you want a screenshot. But here's the thing. My website, bravewriter.com, has a Brave Writer Lifestyle page that has all these categories for you, okay? And I'm gonna show you that at the end. The next thing we're gonna look at, movies and television. Yep, movies and television, part of your curriculum. I am an apologist for the value of TV. <laughs> I might be the only homeschooler in history to say so. Television and movies. They are the huge literary contribution to the story of humanity from the 20th century. Think about it. Think about it. Moving pictures didn't exist until the 20th century. 
And now, how many thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of movies are there? How many television shows are there? This is an enormous leap forward for humankind. And the properties of film are just incredibly rich for our development as people. I like to always say that one of the benefits of TV and movies is that the writing is by people who are trained to write and it is delivered by people who are trained to act to get the maximum value out of the vocabulary. You will understand the meaning of words you don't know better when they are acted than when you read them. I have five kids who grew up on Seinfeld and I tell you now, some of their historical references and their vocabulary, their sense of irony and sense of humor all comes from watching Seinfeld. I mean, it's ridiculous, right? And yet, why wouldn't it? When we're in conversation with our kids, they learn vocabulary and ideas from us. Why wouldn't they learn it from actors acting out a script written by somebody who's good at it? You know, sitcoms, we can decide which ones are valuable or not, but there is an incredible amount of wit that kids learn from a sitcom and the cultural cash of our shared traditions and memories and history. So don't be afraid of it. You don't have to overindulge it. I'm not saying that, but movies and television are super, super valuable in the homeschool. Wonderful, Doctor Who, great idea. Yeah, exactly. And you know, um, we watched things like The Lord of the Rings endlessly, all the Jane Austen renditions, uh, all the E.M. Forster movies. Like you can bring to life the stories that you're reading as well. Wonderful. I didn't see which was your favorite Seinfeld episode, but my gosh, I have so many. <laughs> we quote them to each other all the time. All right, so that's movies and TV. Page two. Now you see why I said, uh-oh, we're not going to finish. But I'm going to try. All right, nature journaling is the next one. Oh, yeah, documentaries, faux shiz. All right, so let's see if I've got a nature journal out here from one of my kids. Aha, I do. Um, so Liam... Oh my gosh, I'm making such a mess. Liam, at the time of this journal, let's see, he was born in 94. Do the math. He was born in 94, and this is in 01. So that means he was seven years old. Here is an example of a nature journal entry from Liam. Nature journaling in our family was basically learning how to draw and taking walks in nature. This um, drawing was based on a book that we call... Uh, that we use called Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain. And she teaches you how to do something called blind contour drawings, modified contour, and then a quick gesture drawing. And that's what this is, all of a leaf. Oops, sorry, all of a leaf, right? Oh, I thought that's what she said, okay. <laughs> gotcha. Um, let's see if I can find another picture for you. Here is an example of a nature journal entry that is like a film strip. So he's putting in a variety of scenes, each inside of a film. Where did I get this printout? Who knows? I'm constantly collecting stuff. Sometimes I used to go to teacher supply stores and just buy stuff because it was fun to use. Um, <laughs> here is nature journaling about the solar system. How awesome is that solar system? Can't you just totally tell what all those planets are just by looking? It's so fabulous, right? He used, you know, um, what do you call it? Oil pastels, so it's especially messy. But I love it so much. What else did we do? Here's a picture of a volcano. Did we see a volcano? No, we saw some movie about volcanoes, and we included it in the Nature Journal. Okay, so Nature Journaling. It can be very simple. Don't feel like you have to be able to do all of this artwork. Just let your kids add it and celebrate the results. Your goal is sort of like this big feast of ideas, widespread exposure, and some opportunity to narrate orally, visually, in writing, in models, in acting it out. Right? That's what narration is. Okay. So we did nature journaling. <laughs> we also were really into birding, Liam especially. So he and I had our own binocular sets, went on bird walks, uh, counted birds for the backyard bird count every year, um, joined the great the great bird count that happens every Christmas. I mean, we did that kind of thing as well. All right, nature journaling. Next one, can you see? 
language, games. So we played card games. We played categories. We played uh, Scrabble. We played, you know, pretty much anything you can think of related to words. Because, hello, that's who I am. You might be playing all math games, and I would take my hat off to you. We didn't do that as much, although some of my kids did. They were all very much into chess. But but in the Brave Writer world, since we're more focused on the writing life, um, we played a lot of language games because that gives you access to words that you might not otherwise have for writing. Yeah, apples to apples is super fun. Um, so catchphrase was a huge popular one with us. When our kids were young, their dad taught at university, and he used to invite his college kids to our house. I'd bake a big lasagna, and then my kids would join the college kids, and we'd all play catchphrase together. If you can have a multi-generational game, even better. It exposes your kids to other uses of language, other images and metaphors that help communicate. Catchphrase is awesome. All right, language games, always worth taking a day off of homeschool to do language games because you'll be right on task, okay? Friday free write. We have tons of those in these notebooks. Let's see if I can find one in Jacob's because I only have his out here. Here's one. <laughs> I saved everything. <laughs> Someone said, oh, you saved so much. I saved everything. I didn't know I would need it. It's just, I don't know, you put in all that work. Don't you want to look back on it fondly in your old age by the fire? I am. That's that's my life right now. Old age by the fire. Okay. Here's a free write. Let's hear what he wrote in 2005. Freedom is a hard-bought thing, a gift no man can give. Thousands of Americans died for our freedom in the Revolutionary War. Throughout history, people have been trying to take or give freedom. In the Revolutionary War, the British wanted control over the colonies, but freedom fighters such as George Washington wanted a democracy. Even much later in our great country's history, we still oppressed minority groups such as blacks. Okay, that's amazing. <laughs> I totally want him to see that. His total dream right now is to see the musical Hamilton, okay? Which is basically this free write. He lives in New York. He's a law student at Columbia right now. Isn't that amazing? It's funny how you see, and his aim is to work in human rights. So back in 2005, 11 years ago, he was already thinking that way. Isn't that beautiful? Don't you love it? Did I know that then? I did not. Oh, I hope you take encouragement from that. Oh, yes, what's the timeline like for all these check marks? Yeah, weekly is good or once a month is good. How about you experiment and see what works for you? I know we went through a binge period. Well, 2005, someone's asking how old he was. He was born in 91. So what would that be? 91 to 2001 is 10 plus uh, four more years. So he was 14. Yep, 14. Um, oh, so about pacing of all of this. I have a Yahoo group list that has everything scheduled so you can kind of see how it fits in on a weekly basis. But I really love to tell you to experiment. So we went on a deep dive binge with art history for a while where it was all we did every day for like months. Then, you know, we go through other periods. I mean, we did read alouds, but what I'm saying is I didn't worry about nature journaling when I was involved in art appreciation. And sometimes nature journaling's awful in Ohio, like February, no one wants to nature journal. So you should think about these like seasonings and things to sort of rotate in. I've seen some of you modern homeschoolers using what you call a loop schedule where you put it on the list and you just keep getting to it eventually. That's what I would do. What a brilliant solution. Just don't forget it exists. Maybe have like a bulletin board with just cards of all these things and move them around to make sure you're hitting them once in a while. That's what I would do. Okay. Yeah, everything ebbs and flows. That's so true, Alicia. She's one of the ones who did a great loop scheduling scope. Follow Alicia, who's supposed to go scoping like three minutes ago, and I'm stepping over her time zone. Sorry, Alicia. Okay, I'm going to hurry through so you can start. <laughs> Okay, Friday free write. We did do them. We did them not every week of their entire lives, but there were seasons where we did them every Friday. Okay, one-on-one -on -one time. What is one-on-one -on -one time? Especially what is one-on-one -on -one time if you have five, six, seven, eight, ten children? 
it's the thing you do when you brush their teeth, right? That's about it. It's when you're tying their shoes, trying to hurry them out the door. There's your one-on-one -on -one time, right? Okay, impossible to get daily one-on-one -on -one time with every one of your kids. Not gonna happen, not gonna happen. This is when you can use a calendar. I, the woman who hates calendars more than any other person in the world, I mean, truly, I avoid them. I don't like them. My staff keeps trying to get me to use one. I refuse to look at it. What I use calendars for is noting things after I've done them. <laughs> and I did do this for a period for one-on-one -on -one time because I noticed that some of my kids were such decent darlings, they never required my attention, while other ones were really, really, really good at getting me to give them all my attention. And when that occurred to me, I thought, you know, I have to make a concerted effort to make eye contact with everybody at least once a week. <laughs> I have five kids, so I figured I could do it once every five days. If you have 10 kids, it'll take you two weeks. So each day, I would make an effort to spend time with one child. And I would, it, it only had to be five minutes. But my rule was this. We had to have eye contact, physical touch, and a real conversation. It couldn't be the typical mom conversation, which is, well, where's the math book? Well, why didn't you put it where you said you would? Well, why do I have to say this every day? We have a place for the math book. Why isn't it in the math book space? Okay, that's not one-on-one -on -one time. One-on-one <laughs> -on -one time is this. Hey, sweetie, come sit by me. Want to page through this art book? Let's look at it together. And then you like play with her hair, and then you flip a few pages, and you're like, Oh, this one's gross. Oh, you like it? Oh, tell me what you like about it. And you do that, you know, for five minutes. And then you've done it. You'll be shocked at how that really builds up. And your kids' emotional banks will actually start to be full because they know that they've touched you, that they've had eye contact with you, that you've hung out together and had a real conversation that's not about their betterment, you know, the endless perfecting of our little humans that mothers are always doing. Yes, good. Okay, so one-on-one -on -one time, very important to the Brave Rider lifestyle. So like I would go bird watching just with Liam, or I would take a nature hike just with Noah and go rock climbing, or I would page through the art book or a fashion magazine with Katrin, or I would sit with Noah while he would explain to me the complexities of some game he was playing. That's what I'm talking about. Quality conversation around things they care about, okay? Writing projects, that's what Brave Writer's all about. And of course, every writing project you see in our products, I've done with my kids. Would you just get that out there? <laughs> Make sure I am not being maligned in the world. I can't stand the thought. For example, lap books these pictures my daughter's lap books okay <laughs> for example let me find this one the egyptian mall um uh mail order mall catalog this is what my children made this is in my house i'm just really defensive about it because i really believe in what we do and i would never want you to think that I'm trying to palm off on you. These, this is a drawing by one of my kids. Um, things that I haven't done. Yeah, I'm just saying, exactly. So, you know, thanks for defending me every now and then. Um, Jot It Down is another one of our tools that has writing projects in it that I've done with my children. We did a whole fairy tale deal. Did I bring that out here? I think I did. Ha 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 ha. Okay. Let's see, oh no, oh, here's an example of a lap book that my daughter made when she was a small child. <laughs> this is my daughter, by the way, who um, didn't know how to write yet, but look at what she did. Look at these trees. This is the kid who could not write yet. Look at these trees. Is that phenomenal? Look at her small motor skills before she could write. Now, here is like her writing which is kind of scary because it's really hard to read. Look at it. It's very neat, but it doesn't make any sense because she didn't know how to spell most words. So then I rewrote it at the bottom so we would know, right? So I just want you to see some of those examples. 
<laughs> who is in the race with Hippomenes? And then we have the answer underneath. Okay. Anyway. Oh, I don't know how old she was. Let's see if I have a, a date in here. She didn't really start reading until she was over 10. So my guess is this is 11. Yeah, probably 11. And actually, um, yeah, I'm sure of it. Probably 10. Somewhere between 10 and 11. Okay, but I was going to show you the fairy tale book. Oh, yeah, here it is. Oh, my God, I found it. Okay, this is so exciting. I always wanted this to be inside of these pictures to be inside the Jot It Down project, but these were missing in action and then resurfaced in a basement purge. Okay, so <laughs> just so you know, I'm just like you. All right, so this is Rapunzel. These are done by Liam or Katrin. No, this is Liam's. Yep. Here's the ugly duckling. I love his artwork. He's really amazing. Here's Goldilocks and the three bears. I know. Are you? I, I, do you mind walking down memory lane with me? Is this silly? Um, here's Alice in Wonderland, the Mad Hatter's Tea Party. Look how big his name is. He's great at his name. This is my dysgraphic child. So he didn't do a lot of handwriting, but he could do some drawing, which is amazing. Um, what's this one? Oh, here's Stuart Little, because he wanted to include that in the fairy tales book. So we did, because why wouldn't we? <laughs> yeah, this is all the stuff you guys do. Oh, apparently we also included the Civil War in the fairy tales book. I don't even know that we did that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very good. Oh my gosh, so many fun things out here. Let's see what else I've got. Oh, remember I was telling you before about the birds? Okay, so when we did our bird stuff, oh my gosh, this is from 1993. 93? This is ages ago. Oh my gosh, I did not even know I still had this. This is pretty cool. Okay, I'm going to show you. So I made a list of all the different birds, blue jay, woodpecker, black crow, quail, scrub jay, rufous sided towhee, California thrasher. And these are from a nature hike that I did with Noah. And he talked to me and I wrote things down. And then on the other side, I did some drawings to show what the bills looked like. And then I wrote about what they ate. Do you see that? Can you see that? This is my own artwork from way back when. And then what we did is we figured out approximations for each of these bills using kitchen tools. And then we actually tried to pick up food using those tools. Okay. So are you getting it? Do you understand what I mean by the lifestyle? Are we there? Okay. Two more things and then we're leaving. The last one is this. Yeah, you guys take pictures. Oh my gosh, we couldn't take pictures. This is back in film. Do you remember film? There were like 24 pictures per camera and you could never see what it looked like until it came back a month later after you remembered to drop it off at the place. And then it came back and the pictures were terrible. Yeah, that's my old life. You guys, Instagram is perfect. Keep all of your photos in a file and you will have the best memories and you don't necessarily need to hold on to all the pieces of paper. Yes, okay. So two more things, ready? Two more and then I'm getting off this scope because we're already at an hour. How come I can't do it for less than an hour, you guys? All right, yes, they're all at my website. The, la the next one is called putting your kid in the driver's seat. Putting your kid in the driver's seat. You know what that means? They teach you what they know that you don't know. So if your kid has an online game that they're really good at and you just, it's invisible to you. You don't care about it. You don't ask about it. You don't know who the characters are. You don't know what level he's on. That's perfect. Ask your son to teach you to play and he's going to find it challenging because you know nothing. <laughs> he's going to have to teach you everything. Now, some of you know a lot because some of you are gamers. I, my, the homeschooling generations coming up now grew up with gaming. So you're way ahead of me, but whatever it can be, ask them to teach you whether it's rock climbing, uh, how to whittle wood, a card game they made up. Katrin used to make up games with all the tools in our house. Or the most famous one was called Stick the Take. We don't know what that means. The rules changed no matter who she was playing so that she always won. 
She's the youngest of five children. Can you imagine why she made up games where she always won? <laughs> so I would sit and let her teach me that game. You want them to feel comfortable explaining things to you. And they can do that best when you don't really know what the answers are. Otherwise, it feels like a pop quiz. Okay, so no pop quizzes. We want you to truly not know something. Let them tell you about what you don't know. And then the very last thing is literary elements. Literary elements. And they are the gold of homeschool, of language. Literary elements are the thing that you use to craft great writing. So I want you to notice them when you're reading poetry, when you're reading the read aloud, when you're in nonfiction. And I give lots of detail about that in the arrow, the boomerang, and the writer's jungle. So it's things like onomatopoeia, alliteration, assonance, consonants, opening hooks, dialogue, powerful verbs, um, repetition of key terms, all of those different kinds of uses of language. Much better than teaching formats. Formats are easy to learn when you're a natural writer, okay? Oh, welcome, glad you're here, Kara D. Very good. Um, yes, I will hold up the list one more time. So let me check off literary elements and then I have the bonus tip, the magic on the last page, okay? Here's literary elements. Here's, oh, wait, oh my gosh. Can you see? Take a quick screenshot and then I gotta put it back. Click, 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 click. Awesome, 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 yeah. Okay, get ready. My mic keeps popping out. Okay, putting it back in. All right, here I am. One more time. All right, ready? Let me stand right in front of it so all you see is the back of my head. Okay, ready? Voila, party school. Basically what I'm talking about is having a party and calling it school. That's what your life can be at home. Today, Sarah McKenzie has an Instagram photo of Caps for Sale. And she said, oh, this is one of the best books of all time. Do you know what I suddenly thought of? My kids, plus my best friend who homeschooled, one day my husband and I were having coffee and pie at the house with the parents. And all of a sudden the kids were all gone and they came back and they acted out a full scale production of Caps for Sale with hats and caps and dress up clothes that they had all collected together. They memorized the book, they directed it, they came out and performed the whole thing. One of my best memories. That's what should be going on in your lives. We did a party school for the solar system. We did a party school for a gold rush, for Jap the study of Japan, for India, uh, for medieval affairs, for birds, for um, how to understand traffic and traffic lights. Like literally, we're constantly thinking about ways to take what we're learning and turning it into a rich experience. And for fun, we just invite other people to do it with us because it's just more fun than doing it alone. And so many of you Brave Scopers are producing the most incredible parties around books that you're teaching and subjects you're studying. And I really, I'm hoping by the fall, we'll have all these options to suggest to you to help you who just need a little you know, kick down the road. Just some suggestions to help catalyze your creativity, right? How to party school when you are a highly sensitive introvert. So then it's all private. Do them one-on-one. -on -one. Go to Barnes and Noble and get coffee or create a very nurturing hidey hole and just do it with your own small group of children. It doesn't have to be big and splashy. It can be personal and intimate, like poetry tea time right? It doesn't have to be big and splashy. You don't have to have my personality to do this. Remember, one-on-one -on -one time, sitting, paging through a notebook. In fact, my very first tea time was not with poetry. It was with Shakespeare. I farmed out four kids and had it alone with Johanna, and she needed one-on-one -on -one time. So it was just Johanna and me doing Leon Garfield's version of Midsummer Night's Dream, eating yogurt, drinking tea, and spending that time together. That's party school, no one else involved. And you know what? She needed that. She was the kid getting overlooked. I, we like to joke that she was the misplaced first child because my oldest child was not a first child personality. <laughs> 
at all. <laughs> so there was Johanna coming along second, you know, cooperative and doing everything she should. It was easy to overlook her. So I didn't. I worked not to overlook her. Okay, we are at the end and I didn't show you half of what I have, but that's okay because we're going to do more of this, but that got you through the list and I will share more of my children's lovely experiences <laughs> with you <laughs> because it's fun for me. Um, and uh, no, Party School isn't on the website. It's in my products though. In fact, Faltering Ownership is a product of projects for the 11 and 12 year old set. And there is a whole thing called the Party School Report that I explain in there and how to do it with any subject. So if you want that product, go get Faltering Ownership. It's in the home study courses in the Brave Writer store. Okay, well, I'm gonna sign off like I always do. Live honestly, write bravely. I'm Julie Bogart from Brave Writer. So much fun today. Thanks for all hopping on, everybody. Love you all. Bye.